This is Hell Creek, Montana. 68 million years ago, a small T-Rex died somewhere around here and over time, minerals replaced its bones which turned its body into a T-Rex fossil. In the year 2000, scientists dug it out of the ground and shipped some of it to a museum and some of it to a paleontologist named Mary Schweitzer. When she first saw those bone samples, she noticed that they looked a little different than normal bone, so she put the sample in an acidic solution hoping to reveal some of the deeper bony structures. After a few days, the sample had completely demineralized, but it left something interesting, a bendable, fibrous substance that looked like blood vessels and a tough connective tissue called collagen some of the kinds of soft tissues you'd expect to see in normal bones. That was not supposed to be possible. Up until this point, we'd only seen evidence of soft tissue, not intact soft tissue. It was thought that this kind of tissue would dissolve pretty quickly after the organism died, but here it was millions of years later. The paleontology community was skeptical, so to prove her point, Schweitzer dipped her vintage collagen in a very specific enzyme called collagenase, and the collagen that had stayed strong for 68 million years dissolved in half an hour. And some scientists think enzymes like collagenase might work because of quantum physics. But how do they know that? First, some background. Left by itself, collagen will break down eventually, but adding an enzyme makes that process happen over a trillion times faster, and that's enzymes' whole thing. They speed up chemical processes by a lot. Look at one of the processes we do all the time. Our cells consume oxygen and produce carbon dioxide as a byproduct. A little bit of that CO2 dissolves in the blood, some attaches to the hemoglobin in our red blood cells, but most of it gets converted into carbonic acid so it can be transported to the lungs and breathed out. Again, that conversion can happen unassisted, but we have a lot of these CO2 molecules to get rid of, so we need to find a way to do a lot of it and do it fast. Without a catalyst, this reaction happens about once every 10 seconds. But add an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase, and now it happens 100,000 times every second. That's about a million times faster than without the enzyme. These enzymes are so useful because they can speed up chemical reactions and even initiate chemical reactions, from the ones we use in our day-to-day -day physiology to the ones we try to manipulate through pharmaceuticals. ACE inhibitors like benazapril or lisinopril are common blood pressure medications. ACE stands for angiotensin converting enzyme, angio for vessel, tensin for tension or pressure. So when angiotensin is converted via this enzyme, it tightens up blood vessels. By inhibiting this enzyme, you're encouraging the blood vessels to dilate and lower blood pressure, and that's what these drugs do. There you go. They're not just useful for dinosaur tissues, enzymes are everywhere. And you can usually spot enzymes because they end in ACE. Lipase, helicase, maltase, all are enzymes and end in ACE. And those prefixes usually tell you what they do. Lipase breaks down lipids, helicase unravels the DNA helix, and maltase breaks maltose into glucose. It doesn't matter which enzyme in the human body you're looking at, they all make biological processes happen faster. And for decades, our classical understanding of mechanics has offered a totally reasonable explanation for how they work. Big picture here. Some of our physiology requires energy to go from reactants to products. We often use this graph with energy on the y-axis and the completion of the reaction on the x-axis. Without the energy to get over this hill, the reaction won't happen. In 1948, an American scientist named Linus Pauling had the idea that enzymes can lower the energy hill because of how they fit together with other chemicals in something called transition state binding. See, each enzyme is specially built to bind to particular reactants, or substrates, kind of like puzzle pieces. But enzymes aren't a perfect fit until the enzyme and the substrate tweak their shape a little bit to fit really tightly together. When they do, the enzyme-substrate combo is said to be in transition state, which lets it break the chemical bonds of that substrate, ultimately speeding up the reaction. After that, the substrate turns into the products and the enzyme can go on to catalyze more reactions. This general concept still holds to modern day. Enzymes lower the activation energy so the chemical reaction happens faster. No quantum chemistry needed, classical chemistry still applies. Fast forward to 1966, and researchers at the University of Pennsylvania saw a reaction that defied classical models. So they explained it with quantum physics. They observed a photosynthetic bacteria that uses light to oxidize a protein called cytochrome. 
When it's exposed to light, the cytochrome donates an electron to the molecules around it. This reaction was shown to be temperature dependent. Hotter conditions increased reaction speeds, colder temperatures slowed them down. Adding an enzyme into the mix still increased reaction speed, but ultimately the whole thing could be influenced by temperature. Here's where things get interesting. That reaction had been demonstrated at extremely low temperatures, like way below zero Celsius. To figure out how that worked, they came up with a machine that would let them shine a super fast, high energy laser at these bacteria and trigger their enzymes to make the reaction happen. When they fired their laser at the bacteria and measured the reaction speed, they found that as they dropped the temperature, the reaction speed dropped too, until they hit negative 173 degrees Celsius, at which point the reaction speed hit a plateau and didn't drop with temperature anymore. This plateau happened all the way down to negative 238 degrees Celsius. So the reaction still had to climb over some kind of hill in order to happen. But according to classical chemistry, the enzyme shouldn't be able to lower the hill as much as they saw in those extremely cold temperatures. In their paper, they proposed that enzymes weren't helping the reaction to lower the hill, maybe they were burrowing through it. This was the first experimental evidence that maybe quantum tunneling could explain this temperature-dependent biological phenomenon. Now, I'm not even gonna pretend to be an expert on quantum tunneling, so I'm gonna hand it over to Jade from the YouTube channel Up and Atom to let her explain it. Take an everyday classical scenario, like trying to roll an object over a hill. If the object isn't given enough energy to get over the hill, it'll simply roll back down. It doesn't matter how many times you try or for how long. If it doesn't have enough energy, it will never get over that hill. But things are different in quantum land. If a particle doesn't have enough energy to jump a barrier, sometimes it can still make it through to the other side. This is because of a phenomenon called wave-particle duality. See, in the quantum realm, particles sometimes act like particles and sometimes like waves. This wave represents the probability of them being in a particular place. So instead of a particle traveling toward a barrier, imagine a wave of probability. Now, when this wave hits the barrier, unlike what a particle would do, which is get 100% rebounded, a tiny, tiny fraction of the wave seeps through. Now, because this wave represents the probability of an electron being there, there is a tiny, tiny probability that the electron will end up being there. So sometimes, even when a quantum particle doesn't have enough energy to jump a barrier, because of its dual wave-like nature, we can still find it on the other side. The results of that experiment in the 60s offered an explanation for how these electrons were able to act more like waves than particles, at least at extremely low temperatures. Now, electrons are really tiny, which makes them more likely to tunnel than bigger particles like protons or neutrons. But about a third of the enzymes out there work by facilitating the transfer of hydrogen, which is mostly proton. So the next challenge for quantum biologists was to figure out if enzymes could make hydrogen tunnel too. In 1989, a team of researchers led by Judith Klinman out of Berkeley set out to prove that this happens thanks to something called the kinetic isotope effect. Atoms get their identity based off of how many protons they have. Hydrogen has one proton, carbon has six, neon has 10. But atoms can have different numbers of neutrons in their nucleus, what we call isotopes of that atom. Hydrogen atoms usually have one neutron, but can come in isotopes where they have two or three neutrons. The interesting chemical properties of an element usually come from its electrons. Changing its neutrons won't change its reactivity much, but it will change how heavy it is and how quickly it reacts, hence kinetic in kinetic isotope effect. Assuming all other conditions stay the same, substituting a heavier isotope of hydrogen ought to result in a slower reaction rate. Classical mechanics lets us predict how much faster a light isotope will react than a heavier isotope. I'm not gonna try to confuse you with the calculations, but just know that it's something that can be calculated. Klinman was interested in an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase, or ADH, which catalyzes this reaction. A hydrogen atom is transferred from benzyl alcohol to benzaldehyde. Replacing the lightest isotope with the heavier isotopes should slow down the reaction in a way that could be predicted. But from a quantum perspective, as soon as you add another neutron onto that hydrogen atom, the ability for it to tunnel drops significantly. For Klinman, the heavier hydrogen isotopes should react much more slowly 
than predicted. Sure enough, that's exactly what her group saw. Protium was catalyzed so much faster than its heavier isotopes that according to the research group, it was acting more like a wave than a particle and thus it had to be tunneling. Now, this experiment happened at 25 degrees Celsius, about room temperature. And that's kind of the kicker here. Life happens at warm temperatures from a quantum perspective. The warmer the temperature, the less likely quantum mechanics has any effects. It's something called quantum decoherence. So in follow-up experiments published in 2004, Klinman and colleagues used the same enzyme in reaction and found that above 30 degrees Celsius, the reaction behaved as predicted by classical mechanics. No quantum mechanics needed. So at the sub-zero temperatures where enzyme quantum tunneling is appreciable, it's too cold for life to survive. So is any of this relevant? Well, sure, it's relevant, but before I just bestow my blessing upon the quantum biology model of enzymes, I wanna draw a more nuanced conclusion. If we revisit Mary Schweitzer and the T-Rex collagen, we see an enzyme at work. Collagenase catalyzed the separation of chemical bonds that had held strong for tens of millions of years. For the temperature and the enzyme involved, quantum decoherence probably prevented any involvement from tunneling, so our dinosaur example probably doesn't take advantage of quantum physics. To give this model a little bit more credit though, there are a lot of unanswered questions within the study of enzymes, and maybe these initial experiments are the thin end of the wedge and quantum biology might help us answer those questions someday. The books and papers that I read to research for this video are obviously gonna say that quantum biology explains everything and it's the coolest thing ever, but hopefully this video showed that it's a lot more complicated than that. It's totally reasonable to say that there is some evidence that enzymes use quantum tunneling in some situations, but that's all we can say for now. If you're sitting there thinking, dang, this is dope, I wanna learn more about this, then go check out this video we did over on Jade's channel, and while you're there, go subscribe to her. She's really good at making difficult things understandable. As always, thank you to my patrons on Patreon, I couldn't do it without you. To everyone else, make sure to like the video, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the bell so you get notified when I post a new video. Have fun, be good, I'll see you next time.